What's going on? Coach, thanks for joining us today. We've got um, well, around 30 media on uh, on this call today. So we'll go ahead and I think we'll go ahead and just get started with questions unless you want to have an opening statement today. You want me to make an opening statement? Uh, well, where we're at going in, it's, it's been a couple of weeks since we've. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So once one, last time we've had you guys as a group, obviously was, um, I guess, the day that I uh, arrived. So, um, yeah, very excited to finally put the, the 10 coaches in the room together. I had my first uh, full staff meeting on uh, Sunday afternoon with uh, the addition of George and, and uh, Kevin Kane. So have my 10 coaches in there has been awesome. I kind of put the finishing touches on some support staff outside of uh, outside of the uh, football world. Thank you. Um, but couldn't be more excited about those group of guys and then really to get around our guys this week. So we came in last week on Sunday, started a four day protocol that we had to go through for our student athletes to get them cleared, to get in the building. Um, because of NCAA rules, we couldn't start doing anything physically with them as far as testing or uh, conditioning or movements, but we could go to three day analysis. So they were with Jeremy uh, and, and uh, Tank really just basically looking at every aspect of their body, body composition, uh, stretching, flexibility, movement, uh, all kinds of measurables uh, that really give us a baseline of where they're at physically. I think as you talk to the kids, they were probably uh, taken aback by that. They never really gone through something like that. It really gave us a physical assessment of where they are, from positives, negatives, under development, over development, certain guys that have had injury issues in the past, looking at why that happened and what we can do to prevent it. So a lot of just educational things on their body. And then we hit the, hit the ground running on Monday. We basically are in uh, four day, uh, four different groups a day. First one starts at six, uh, goes an hour and a half, four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, We're in two groups on Saturday. Uh, they're off on Wednesday and Sunday by NCA rules. Um, and then an added uh, bonus to getting in that 6 a.m. workout group. You also have to come in a half hour in advance of that to get your COVID test in and a hydration and fueling. Uh, so they get a little uh, hydration station and a, and a fueling station where we try to put something in their body to get them right for their workout. So that's kind of where they're at right now. We'll leave them uh, in that field for about the first four weeks here. Then as coaches, we'll begin to integrate with them on the field in week five. We'll go through an eight-week window here to get them ready for spring ball, and then we'll hit the ground running. That's really about where we're at. All right, Coach, we'll start with uh, Bob Osmussen from News Gazette, and then Robert, and then Alec, right, in, uh, in that order. So go ahead, Bob. Hey, Coach, good to see you again. Good to see you, Bob. I, I got a two-parter. I could limit it to one. Um, first of all, what's the next thing for the staff? You got them all together. What's the most important thing you got to do now? And my second question is, what do you, uh, for you family-wise, huh? you know, all the personal stuff is going on. How busy is that? How's that working for you, too? I, I, I got the first part. I'll, I'll answer that, and we'll come back. But the first part was really just what's the most important part of the staff right now. It's really us <laughs> on the same page, right? So, it was very important for me to hire a coordinator I had not worked with in the past. I wanted to bring in fresh blood to my mix. Um, so I wanted to hire coordinators that the guys that were new to me, I, I'd known obviously Tony for a long time, knew what he's about. He'd been in several different systems as a play caller. Uh, actually uh, the way Ryan and I got introduced was first competing against each other on the field uh, in the SEC and then gotten to know several people that knew him and just kept talking about his presence, his awareness, his demeanor, um, so he was a guy that I was kind of targeted in on uh, to try and come in and talk. So once he agreed to come to campus here, it was really Ryan and I getting to know each other. I brought several people on campus. I only offered the defensive coordinator job to one guy, and that guy was Ryan Walters, and he took it. So it was important for me to get the guy that I wanted. Um, and, and now, really, after I had Tony and, 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 and Walt in place, then I started working on the rest of the staff, building it. Really, I concentrated one guy at a time on both sides of the ball building off strengths and weaknesses that I thought currently existed um, and was able to build it. And then the finale with the last two guys, but none of these guys, even though they may have worked together in the past at times, um, really it's, it's bringing five guys together on both sides of the ball that never worked together. And then uh, obviously uh, 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 Ben Miller will run our special teams as well, working with our specialists. So to get him in place, so really to get those three phases of the game together here for about the next six weeks is going to be building a playbook understanding what our student athletes are really playbook doesn't matter if our athletes don't match it. So we go down and observe our athletes in the, in the strength and conditioning cycles that tank and his crew is putting them through, getting an idea of what we have, getting our roster in the right position. And then we'll put the X's and O's together in that at a, at a later time. And then the other, other part was personal life, family, you guys uh, moving all that stuff is that long down the road. 
Yeah, we're uh, we actually have a lot. We're building a house here in Champaign. Um, so that'll take a little bit of time. So we'll move into a rental. Um, uh, I'm here. My daughters are uh, back back home, but I get to see them in uh, 10 days. Um, uh, my oldest daughter is uh, uh, got me in the heart the other day. I was uh, hanging up the phone. I usually say, hey, Belle, and I'll like I'll say I love you or something like that. And she's like, hey, dad, I was trying to get I was running into a meeting. She said, hey, dad, I'm like, no, she's like, can you just come home? And it was like just like a straight dagger in the heart. Uh, but it's just uh, one of the things we're dealing with right now. We'll all be together soon enough. So it, it, it's in progress, but uh, we're learning FaceTime pretty good. Thanks, coach. Yep. Hey, Robert Rosenthal, you're up. Alan on deck. Go ahead, Robert. Hey, Coach, in, in talking to all the uh, assistants on these Zoom calls, you can't help but notice a lot of them have very head coach qualities. Kevin Kane, George McDonald, you know, even other assistants like like Bart Miller, like Aaron Henry, they, they all have this very commanding presence. Is that something you're looking for when you're evaluating the staff? And I appreciate the question, Robert. Um, I don't know if I sit there and say, is this guy going to be a head coach? But I think the kind of coach I want, they're going to, they're going to, you know, contain those qualities. I want great communicators, great teachers. I like personalities. I like people uh, that, that are different than me. I like to surround myself with people that don't necessarily think like me all the time, but they know how I think to hire two former players and Aaron and, and JMO. Um, I've never been able to do that as a head coach, but they're walking proof of what I want. And I think it's going to be great for our players to see that. If there's one thing I began to understand about our players uh, in general was I, I think they need some people that uh, can guide them through a lot bigger things than just what the X's and O's are going to be. So um, that's part of it. But I, I do, I, I think you always hire guys that want to become better. And, and um, you know, I, I, I think we'll have uh, uh, a lot of, um, early uh, um, development with our guys just because they see guys that kind of capture their personality or their minds and then they'll they'll make them follow them and lead them down a path and make them a better player in the end. And we've given the two, the associate head coach and assistant head coach. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what those roles are, you know, in addition to their position? Yeah, absolutely. So George, uh, George and I have a very long history together. Um, uh, <laughs> I give him heat a little bit all the time because I hired him in Arkansas and he left me um, standing at the altar pretty much. Uh, but he he moved on to an opportunity to be a play caller at and, and, and Syracuse. And I totally understood uh, when it happened, why it happened and, and quickly got over it. Uh, he's, he and I have been uh, associates for a long time and I'm finally glad to get him here working. Uh, the reason I gave him assistant head coach is I wanted to get him here and and, and, and have an effect on what we he, he is a great embodiment of what we're looking for here. I know the winning record maybe while he was here wasn't exactly one that he, he was uh, proud of. I know you guys brought that up to him the other day, but he's very proud of this university and what it means and what it made him today. So to bring him as an assistant head coach, he'll specifically work with me on a lot of player development. So he'll work with the offense and the wide receivers, but I'm gonna really lean on him. One of the things that's always followed him in his career is the player's lives that he touched both as a, even if you have a player Talk about a coach that is at a school that he didn't go to. You know that you know that coach has reached him. You know that coach has touched him. And uh, you know I brought uh, uh, C.J. Hart here, and, and he didn't even have any idea uh, that in the end that I was going to have Coach McDonald come here. And 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 he was who recruited him to NC State. You know there wasn't any connection or anything like that. But it was just one of those things that you saw early on the profound effect that he had on on C.J. So. Um, he'll work with me specifically on player development uh, and, and, and trying to get our players to understand all the things away from the game. Um, and then obviously be a huge factor for uh, his, his ability to, to dissect offense and, and, and the wide receiver position skill set is, is pretty special. Um, he really stood out. And then uh, Kevin, um, you know, a guy that I've known for a long time, um, uh, was a GA for me. I saw his career just grow. And he's a guy right away, to your point, Robert, when I first met him, I'm like, this guy is going to be something someday. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch him grow. So he was a guy that I initially had on my uh, defensive coordinator list, a guy I was thought about considering. But, you know, obviously when I went in the direction with uh, Ryan, I didn't think it was going to be in that ballpark or, or have an option to do that. And then uh, Mark Torsani and him uh, had kind of exchanged some messages. And he said, you know, I think Kevin might be able to come, you know, if you, if you, you know, are interested. And of course, I'm like, absolutely, I'm interested. So I reached out, talked about the ability to come as an associate head coach. Um, he's never been a, a, a full-time coach under me. Um, he went and worked for Dave Dorn, a couple other places. So I really want Kevin to be involved in game day management. 
Uh, and then both those two guys will really be heavily involved with the recruiting and the personnel side of their respective sides of the ball, offense and defense. You know, I'll keep Ryan and Tony so busy with what they're doing schematically. Those two guys will be the people that Pat Hamilton and, and I will sit down and talk about how our roster pieces together um, and, and how it works in the fall, in the spring, and then, of course, during recruiting. Okay, Alec Buss, you're up, and then Jeremy on deck. Go ahead, Alec. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Coach, now that your whole staff is put into place, does your recruiting effort maybe become easier to communicate, or is it easier to get that message to potential future players? Uh, Alec, you know, I've been really from the day I was hired, I was a one-man band that first day, right? I was kind of doing this all on my own. Um, I met with the staff. I didn't know that I was going to hire Corey at that time. I really liked him, but I wasn't going to hire a running backs coach until I hired a coordinator. So my day from first day from jump to where we are now has been four phases, recruiting our current roster, recruiting a future roster, recruiting a, a, a group of coaches, and then also just relations within the university, right? So I did a lot of alumni events. I did a lot of Zoom calls to former you know, alumni, former student athletes, former football players. It was really my day every day was those four aspects. So I, I appreciate the question. Um, as my numbers have decreased uh, the, of, of but I still got a lot of staff. I got to hire and personnel recruiting and whatnot, but we pretty much, my mornings are pretty much committed to, to staffing and developing football X's and O's my afternoon. This little room I'm in this is my zoom room. Uh, uh, I, I, I knew we were going to be doing a lot of zoom. So one of the first things I did is met with the administration here and we turned this little, uh, little office space. I get to look into the indoor. I watch women's soccer, baseball, everybody's down there uh, going crazy. And I get to sit up here in this little zoom room and, I Zoom parents, I Zoom coaches, I Zoom uh, prospects, uh, 21s, 22s, 23s, you name it, uh, we've been doing it. And then a quick follow-up, what has your kind of interaction been like with the former football players that you've talked to that are now alumni of the university? Uh, it's been good. Um, you know, because of my profession, I've been in the NFL the last three years. I've become and built relationships with some of the former alumni here that, that, that uh, played, but also a lot of my former players who are friends with former Illinois alum, right? So the first, I think the first text I read was uh, uh, from Tony Passos, who had talked to Joe Thomas and Colt McCoy. Um, Colt and I were together in New York. And, and uh, uh, of course, he was with Joe, I guess, in Cleveland. And uh, uh, have had a spirited conversation uh, with him. And, and you could tell he was pretty wound up. And it's just it was fun. Like I got on a zoom call and then really to have Josh as the centerpiece of this whole thing. Here's a former, uh, you know, letter win, letter, letter winner, a former football player, a war the block guy. He understands what it's all about to, to have him on a zoom call with former athletes or form, former football players. It's just, and, and, you know, they, they, they go at him a little bit. That's kind of fun to watch uh, the uh, jousting that goes on uh, in that light a little bit, you know, so it's just a very unique atmosphere, but it's been a lot of fun. Of course, I realize I'm undefeated too, so I'm popular right now as it is. So we, I get it. Thanks, Coach. Yep. Okay, Jeremy Warner, you're up. Mark Pearson on deck. Go ahead, Jeremy. Hey, Brad. Hope you're well. Um, just wondering, you've done this before in the past, where you inherit a roster, you inherit a team, but you also want to bring what you want to do into it. How do you balance, you know, adapting what you do to the players, but also them adapting to you and what you want to run? Great question, Jeremy. I would say that's probably my biggest unknown, right? Because the first time I met him, I'm sitting in a room and I'm at the front of the room with a mask on. I'm looking at a room of guys that I don't know with masks on. And, and it's just a very unusual, you know, way to introduce one another. And so I had that initial meeting with him. I was just being me. I was being real. Um, then had some individual meetings after that, got a little bit of feedback. Yes, or that. But now we've had several Zoom meetings with the players where I my personality comes out a little more. We've been doing some football one-on-one. -on -one, so I think they've really enjoyed the football side. I not really anything X's and O's, but we looked at first down success. We looked at second down success. We talked about, you know, the way turnovers affect the game. We looked at the national championship game, first series for Ohio State, second series for Ohio State, and how, how they differed. Um, talked about how you play the game in certain ways. So there's, there's some fun there with football, but also every one of my coaches was introduced to them. Um, all my coaches are, are family, you know, their dads, their, their husbands, their fathers. Um, uh, so I had them introduce themselves, but they also introduce their families to the team. So I want those guys to understand if we're going to talk about an Illini family, they better understand these guys have families as well. Um, the, the very unique thing to this, and I told Josh this early in the recruiting process or when he started talking to me was everybody thinks this COVID thing's a bad deal, like for 
for the way it's restrictive. But in reality, there's never been a better time to be a Division I football transition because you could recruit an entire class of seniors, uh, which I, I, I try to actively every day. Um, some stayed, some moved on, uh, and, and uh, was able to keep a lot of guys that I think normally would have went out the door. So that was a huge asset for the guys that uh, could retain. So it was really like a whole bonus class. Um, and then, you know, because of this grad transfer rule, it's something that's very intriguing. We've already added a couple guys uh, uh, to our roster now that I think, A, I know they needed to be good players, but they need to be good people. I want to bring in people that represent what I, I know we need here. And, you know, that's why we specifically targeted not just players, but maybe players from certain types of programs that have a winning tradition. Um, you know, some of them very, very winning traditions that, that like to bring that into your locker room is a very unique thing. You can bring it in as a coach, but if you can bring it in as a player, uh, that's saying something. Yeah. And then building off of that, you know, with the roster and the, the guys you're, you're keeping, um, obviously you have a chance to compete right away, but you also are bringing in transfers, but you're also bringing in prep guys. How do you balance that? The, the transfer additions to help you win right away and how important is that, but also guys that can eventually, you know, run the systems and things that you want to do. Well, grad transfers, you know, are, are really three different levels. They're one year, two year and three year grad transfers. So, you know, sometimes you would bring in a JUCO or a, a transfer player and they got three years and maybe they aren't coming in for all the right reasons, right? But now, if you're a grad transfer, A, you usually got a degree. That means you're pretty dang smart. Uh, second, you're looking for a new opportunity and you're a little bit mature in the recruiting process. So you're getting a different type of player walking in the door. And the third thing is you got to adjust address positions of needs, right? So, you know, uh, being honest, right? So I try to recruit Jake. Uh, and, and, you know, inside backer, I knew it was a depth issue. So those are things that I want to address right away. Um, we'll kind of get more specific, but also something was very unique here. I was hired basically three or four days after a national signing date where they signed a, a group of guys that I had no, no, you know, factor into or, 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 or a, and develop, you know, who we offered why we offered them or, or what kind of player they are. So those guys are all welcomed into our family, we reached out to them. We built a relationship, a couple of them are on campus here already. But I didn't really want to go back into 2021 and get some guys just to get guys. I want to get guys of high caliber. So we'll sign a couple guys here in, a, in, a, in about a week. But uh, for the most part, I, I really concentrated on players that we could add right now that I knew. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, hey, Mark Pearson, you're up. And Joey Wagner on deck. Go ahead, Mark. Great to see you again, Coach. Uh, you started the hashtag family, and you've already said it several times and, and showed it by, you know, sending Ashley Jamison some flowers and stuff like that. Now that your staff is officially assembled, you know, how much does it truly feel like a family, and why do you feel that's so important? That's a great question. Uh, so I think because I had said it a lot, um, that was actually uh, Travis, um, had, uh, one of our graphics guys, had, had come up with that graphic, which I thought was absolutely awesome. So I stole it. Um, but uh, we, we – uh, um, talk about it a lot and you know it's funny like Ashley so when going back to my first time ever as a head coach I was a 30 mid 30s 35 I guess um, and as I hired my staff I sent flowers to new coaches whenever I hire them I send because a lot of time the wives don't get to be a part of it right so I sent flowers to every coach that I've hired in my entire coaching career a lot of them would say it was the first time anybody had ever done that so it's kind of interesting this is my second hire of Andy Boo and uh, um uh, because of certain situations in the past, I, I've waited till the final staff is done in case I lost anybody along the way. So I wanted to make sure we were complete before I sent them. And, and I was talking to Andy the night before and he goes, you know, Kelly asked me where her flowers were the other day. I said, hold on, they're coming. They're coming. We just got to get this whole staff uh, completed. So uh, that's just something I believe in. And the quarterback club here uh, helped us do that. Um, so I think the more you can say it and, and then it's not just saying it and preaching it. It's actually, that's why I have my coaches when they introduce themselves to the players, they had a picture of their family right behind them. And, you know, I know I got a lot of good recruiters because they got a lot of wives that are, are, are way out of their league. Right. So I thought it's good to let those guys understand, Hey, they got kids behind them. They stand for something more than just what's on their, uh, on their wall. You know, they they stand for their families as well. And then one quick follow-up with all the coaches. Obviously, the Smith Center was was used to recruit players, but how much did you use it to recruit coaches as well? It, it is, and I tell you, it's big now. It's in Zoom, so we'll do a Zoom attack where we'll have our whole staff basically stand in a conga line, and they'll just get on Zoom, and, they'll, and we'll introduce, whether it's an offensive player or a defense player, all my coaches will introduce themselves, and then we'll go on a virtual tour through the building. So 
even though we're in COVID, they can't visit. They're still visiting our facility, and it's pretty awesome. Um, but I would tell you the coaches' reactions when they come in this building for the first time. Uh, George McDonald, I think, still is flawed, you know, just floored by the uh, uh, this building compared to the one he grew up in uh, several years back. And, and, you know, I was trying to maintain a three-year-old and a, two, and a one-and-a-half-year-old when I walked in. So I, I, I kind of took a moment to take a step back um, as well. But it's been a very impressive building, and, and I love showing it off. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. Yep. Okay, hey, Joey Wagner, you're up. Nico on deck. Go ahead, Joey. Hey, Brett, you talked about hiring coordinators that you hadn't previously worked with. Why was that important, and has that philosophy changed over time for you? Yeah, so – if you really check my history, like, so when I took over at Wisconsin, I retained the coordinator there, uh, Paul Christ, who obviously is a pretty good coach. He's still there. Uh, and uh, I kept with me for six years, I believe. Uh, my first defensive coordinator was Mike Hankwitz, who's a pretty good coordinator. My second coordinator was Dave Dorn, who I promoted from within. My third defense coordinator was Chris Ash, who I promoted from within. And then my fourth defense coordinator uh, was, was Rob Smith, who had been a GA for me back in my earlier days at Iowa. So, and then Paul Rhodes was promoted from within. So I like to bring guys from within once I get it going. But I thought just the league, you know, um, I was very aware that I wanted to make this identity unique to Illinois. So I wanted to build that with someone that was coming in at the same time as me. Um, and I thought to kind of all of us start off on the same foot and build it the Illini way, it was very important. And I didn't think if you, I didn't want someone just to walk in and, you know, put down a playbook and say, this is what we're running. I want to build off our strengths here and work together as a staff. So it's it's part of the building process to what we want to do here to sustain success. And then what was the most important thing that you were looking for as you put this together and the timing of which that you you hired? I mean, was the timing purposeful in the way that you went order to order here? Um, it was purposeful. Um, you know, Kent can attest to this. Like, so I, I, I knew what my plan was, was to kind of hire a couple guys and I was going to work on the next position, which was my, you know, uh, offensive line coach I wanted to get next, which ended up being Bart Miller, but Bart and Tony were really about the same day, weren't they, Ken, as far as when they got cleared, you know, to get announced, and we were going to announce them, and I told Kent, like, hey, media guru, like, why don't we wait these and, and announce them on two separate days so that they both get a little bit of media attention and splash, you know, so that was a little bit diligent. Um, there might have been two guys that would have been on the same day, but I kind of tried to give every guy a day to, so the media could meet them and the, and the fan base during a slow time period. Um, but it was also purposeful because, you know, I might make a receiver decision or a tight end decision off of what I hired at running backs. And to be quite honest, you know, Corey Patterson was a guy, I never knew who Corey Patterson was. I saw his face in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a computer screen when I looked up the current staff and I read about him. And when I went in and met that staff, I was just engaged right away with his personality. I brought him in for a, an interview with just me the next day. I said, Hey, just hang tight. I'm going to hire a coordinator. Once the coordinator's in here and I hire an O-line coach, then we'll interview you as a, as a potential assistant coach. And he came in and knocked it out of the park and, and we asked him to stay. And that to me is how you build a staff. You learn everything about where you're at and you build on it from there. And then uh, to get Kevin and, and uh, uh, um, Gio at the end was just icing on the cake. Thanks, Brett. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll go with Matt Stevens and then uh, Nico. Go ahead, Matt. Fred, I've read a lot of off-season pieces about the uh, name, image, and likeness world that we're about to enter in in college football and college athletics. I I've heard a lot of coaches aren't really excited about this and, and find it to be a little bit more of a hassle than they want it to be. Do, do you find that to kind of almost be a cop-out um, and guys that are kind of rejecting where we are in 2021? Or do you find it to be a legit concern moving forward as a college football head coach? Well, I think it's, it's, it's one of the things that, Matt, to your point, like, as head coaches, you, you got to just tell me the rules and I'll play by them, right? Whether I like them or don't like them. I don't like the fact that I got to tweet graphics, right? That doesn't exactly make my day uh, as, as a division one head coach to figure out how cool a graphic I can come up with or our, our recruiting department, but it's big to our players. It's big in recruiting. This name imaging likeness is going to be something that comes on us and we got to be prepared for it. In the coming days, you'll see some, some direction that we're taking that is kind of new to what they've done here, but definitely even kind of new to what college football has seen because I, I've, as I've sat back in the NFL world for three years and see these guys build their brand, once they're NFL players, I knew at some point it was going to find its way down to college football. And that's what we're kind of seeing. So um, I hope to be on the cutting edge of it. I've, I'm going to bring some people on board that'll really help us understand what that means and people that have been specifically in this world and how it can help our student athletes. 
both our current roster. Now, this is also a unique thing. So you're going to begin to cultivate these young men as 16, 17, 18-year-old recruits, and then you're going to get them on campus and you will build their identity as Illini football players that then will, you know, eventually graduate with them into their life beyond football here or to the NFL. And it's, it's definitely a work in progress. I wanted to ask you an on the field question too, which is I, when I covered the SEC, you were a big campaigner of, you know, the tempo offenses and the RPOs as, you know, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but unsafe. And you had, there were some unsafe elements to it. Have you adapted that line of thinking or do you still have concerns about where we're going with football in terms of tempo and trying to get defensive guys, you know, substituted in just so you, you know, they can stay healthy. Yeah. I understand the question and you are putting words in my mouth. You can say you're not, but you did. Um, so like the part that is really, I think been great about my transition here to Illinois is now you can open up a new world, a new identity. Um, you know, at Wisconsin, obviously we ran a style of play that I felt fit us at that time in what we did and then converted it to a different level down in Arkansas. But there was obviously a transitional time there, you know, um, in our, our way of playing. And then we are an offense here that we will use tempo. We will use, uh, the clock, the NF, uh, the NCAA, NCAA has decided to stay in the world they've stayed in that allows, uh, you know, I, in my opinion, some advantage for tempo, uh, uh, offensive uh, substitution to defensive play. So I think the fact that, you know, you have to uh, move and transition to what you think can be successful and the college football world changes on a, on a yearly basis. And all we're going to do is try to transition with it to give us the best advantage for us. Thanks, Brett. Yep. Hey, Nico, you're up. Scott Beatty on deck. Go ahead, Nico. Hey, Coach. Uh, last month at your introductory press conference, you put such a big priority on in-state recruiting, and then you wanted to focus on the current roster before turning your attention to some transfers who could come in to help the program. Only took about two, two or three weeks before you had check marks next to all three of those plans that you had set. How important was it for you to come in and not just say that early, but you know, really take advantage of all three of those and accomplish all three of those things early on to really show what you uh, what you kind of meant by that. The advantage of being a a, a a head coach through this third time now is you just you just have a better perspective on what you need to do and how you need to do it, and basically the plan to get there. So I I, I knew what we needed to get done, but it's it's a constant reinforcement. I just had a meeting with my staff yesterday. Listen, we we were here two weeks ago. I haven't, you know, we need to keep this thing. This isn't just a short-term answer. This is a long-term uh, uh, discussion. So um, it's on, it, it's honestly every day I kind of have those four different things I talked about at the beginning as a, as a daily plan and how are we moving in that direction. So, you know, if I have four Zooms this afternoon, probably one's going to be a 21 in-state, I mean, a, 20, a 21 uh, 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 transfer, a 21 high school, a 22 uh, in-state and a 22 out-state. We do about an hour, hour and a half Zoom it with each kid and their family. You know, it knocks out quite a bit of your day, uh, but it, it's, it's you just got to stay. If I just concentrate in one world, you naturally aren't touching the other world. So I try to just balance it up as best I can. And then I want to kind of shift attention a, a little bit where, you know, people are awaiting an announcement from the IHSA today on scheduling. I know a couple of weeks ago you offered your support, any help that you could provide to the IHSA moving forward with high school football. What exactly did that entail and what did it mean for you? And I know Brad Underwood as well, Dan Hartlib to kind of just show that the, the university has the, the back of the IHSA moving forward. Well, first and foremost, obviously I'm a football coach. I don't have any doctorate degree or, or any uh, opinion on, you know, I just want everything to be safe. Like in today's world, like we all have almost become numb to it, but we all have to understand that like we're dealing with something. I have two parents that are in their eighties. Um, we have pre-existing conditions, you know, uh, uh, when I heard 50 and overweight is a category, I'm like, Hey, that's me. Like, so I, I'm into that wheelhouse as well. Like I, I you, you just gotta be aware that, that this is a thing that's in our society today that isn't going away. So the people that are in charge that are making that decision, I knew that they're in uh, the number one priorities to make sure that happens on the same account, you know, every high school kid and coach that I talked to, you could just see it was weighing on their heart. Um, and that's all I was kind of just stressing was, Hey, I was there, you know, and really, you know, everybody thinks that all my experiences would be from football. Like one of my greatest experiences uh, in, in high school was, you know, being in other sports, being involved in wrestling, being involved in track. Um, my wrestling coach was Kai Dagami. My track coach was Irv Sanderson. And like those guys had huge impressions on me as a coach. And uh, um, I know that's going out there in our youth of the, of, of the state here today. And, and 
um, brings about so many great memories. That's all I was kind of expressing is I hope these guys are able to share those same things. So it sounds like it's moving in the right direction, but the people in charge will make that decision when it needs to happen. Thanks so much. Yep. Hey, Scott Beatty and then Greg uh, Palermo after on deck. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, Coach, you said something that piqued my interest about um, injury prevention and some of the stuff you're starting to do. Is that something you're bringing in as what you've been doing? Is that something you saw that needed to change here? I see, you know, I hear and see about injuries in football and think, well, okay, that's, that's football. The injuries happen, but do you see something there that can reduce those? Yeah, I would say that, you know, you can probably get in depth with Tank uh, in, a, in an interview with him, but one of the things that we proactively talk about with our with our recruits and their parents is um, it's not just, you know, slapping weights on their back or telling them to push this or run that. We try to do as much as we can with today's student athlete to, to build balance in their body. So some of these measurements, you'll see kids that maybe had a shoulder injury at some point earlier in their career, and they've always just overemphasized with the other shoulder. So now their body's basically out of alignment and, and can't train or, or, or fully maximize their potential. Um, soft tissue is, a, 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 and especially the lower body. So like when we did testing the other day, we did not do 40s. We, we will not do a 40 as long as you play football for me at the University of Illinois, because most 40s are, are popped when they, when they do something with their lower body. It's after 20 yards when they get in full stride, full speed. So we just did 10 and 20 yards. Um, we consciously did that because I didn't want to lose a guy uh, uh, six weeks of our winter conditioning because he pulled his hamstring the first three days out. Four, and, and we're not really touching them as coaches till week five because I just don't think these guys were quite where they need to be physically for us to kind of jump in because we're all amped up. We're going to want to uh, take it to another level. And I wanted Tank and his crew to really have a full understanding of where they're at physically before we jump in and start doing some things with them. Um, if you want to do a great story, uh, uh, Tank assembled a group of five coaches down to him and four other coaches who come uh, from various expertise, uh, you know, Vanderbilt, Army, um, another guy was in private uh, the sector. These guys all have very specific um, areas that, and, that are really, really uh, good for our student athletes that they hone in on. I, I'm, I've had some good strength coaches and some staffs in the past, but these guys are at a whole nother level, including nutrition. So it's, it's kind of fun to see these guys interact and they've really made a huge impact on our players. And then uh, just as we've been here, I guess it came out that uh, Pat Fitzgerald up at Northwestern has got a huge extension. He's going to be there for a while. Any thoughts on, uh, does it feel like that's a school you have to change the tide against more than a, another school? And I know you've faced him plenty. Yeah, no, I think the Big Ten West is obviously a, a, a great division. Um, a lot of respect for all the coaches in this thing. Obviously, it's so unique, right? I mean, I, I worked for Kirk Ferentz for three years. You know, I mean, what more tie can you have? The guy that, you know, gave me a job, like, uh, somebody that has been a traditional powerhouse in this conference for a long time. You look at the last five years, the Big Ten West has been represented by Wisconsin three times, Northwestern twice. Um, there's a reason I gravitated to Fitz when we were both young coaches um, uh, that we would meet on the road and talk. I, I, I visited with him about staffing at every, different times in my life. Uh, Fitz and I are very close. Um, uh, when I got the job, I got a great text from him. And then, you know, Paul, when I called Paul, um, who's obviously been a huge part of, of, success I had at Wisconsin and we constantly, I talked to him this morning, actually, like he's a guy that, um, you know, it, it's just, it's a different flow. I mean, obviously I want to beat everybody in the West. It's, I think the outside world looks at coaches that um, have been around each other a bit as like a big deal, but it's really about the players on the field. If the coach tries to make it more than that, they're probably in the wrong business. Like it's always going to be about the players on the field. Um, I think about when I left this conference, one of the first calls I got was from Fitz. I talked to Kirk um, and different coaches when I left and they were like, I'm glad you're gone, you know? So I knew there was going to be a reaction when I came back in, um, but I, I'm excited. This is the greatest conference. Uh, I, I felt that way for a long time. Uh, had a talk, chance to talk to the commission the other night and, and just how excited I am to be back in this conference and, and, and hopefully represent everything the right way. Thanks. Hey, uh, Greg Palermo up and Marley on deck. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, thanks, Coach. Uh, <clears throat> with recruiting, I'm curious if you can describe how you have broken it up. Do you have a plan for all of your assistants to recruit Illinois and then have geographic areas? Uh, is it by their their position group? Uh, can you explain how that's being broken up? Yeah, uh, Greg, absolutely. So have 10 coaches, you know, that uh, will be assigned a specific area across the country for sure. 
Um, but all 10 of our coaches uh, actually passed on a nice job. We've divided the state up into 10 different, uh, basically, geographic areas. Some of them will, you know, like, for instance, Bart Miller will hit the upper side of the, of, of the Chicagoland area and then work his way into Wisconsin. Um, Tony Peterson, uh, who's got family in Minnesota, he'll hit his, his path on his way to Minnesota. Um, uh, obviously, uh, Corey Patterson, you know, will do the St. Louis area, so he'll have a part of Illinois down that way. Um, We'll, we'll reveal that as we go forward, but, um, you know, I, I need my 10 coaches all to recruit, but I would say Tony and, and uh, uh, Walt, Ryan will, will, will have, you know, one area outside of that Illinois area, but they're going to have a minimal recruiting obligation, whereas the other eight coaches are going to have a huge part. And then I would say that, you know, they will have a primary area out of state, but they'll also have a secondary area. So a guy like um, uh, George uh, McDonald, so he has – uh, he's from the Indiana area, so he'll hit Indy, but that's a direct flight down to Fort Lauderdale, you know, so you you can tie things into like um, Kevin Kane, who's very strong in Kansas City. He'll have Dallas and Kansas City, so it makes sense on how he flies with a direct path, you know, a direct flight out of Champaign. It flies from Charlotte, Champaign, and Chicago every day. We go to Bloomington, and now you have flights that open up to Denver, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Dallas again, but there's different Orlando. So there's direct flights out of Bloomington that that factors into where we're going to recruit and how we're going to recruit it. And then uh, lastly, I couldn't help in looking at Terrence Jamison's background from when he was a recruit. Uh, here's an Illinois guy who obviously showed that he had the potential to play division one in the power five conference, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan state, Northwestern, uh, appeared to get in on him and Illinois kind of didn't happen at the end. Um, what do you tell the, the next Terrence Jameson uh, that you come across in, in the recruiting trail uh, to, to make him uh, more of a priority for Illinois staff moving forward? Yeah, great, great point. So here's two things, right? So you guys will get to know me a little bit better. I don't care about anybody else, right? So like, I don't go in and talk about um, any other school except for the University of Illinois. And what I'll tell them is, and I've said this a million times on the phone to player, parents and players that we're recruiting currently, I can't control anything that Illinois has done or been a part of in the past. All I can do is control what we are in the future. And there isn't going to be a program in the country that's going to recruit you harder to come to your home state, right? So in this state, traditionally, there's 25 to 35, somewhere in between Division One, Power 5 players every year that come out. They have been leaving the state, right? But if you can get a large majority of them to stay, um, that's going to be a huge step in the right direction on a, on a continual basis. Now, where it get, and I'm not, I'm not just talking about uh, players that are leaving now. Like if there's another Illinois player that's somewhere else that because of this world we're in with grad transfers and portal transfers, and if they want to come back home, I want them back home if they can help us win a championship. So I really can't control anybody else or I can't control what's happened in the past. All we worry about is what we're going to do in the future, and that's what Illinois is going to do. All right, Marley, Thanks, you're up. Brett Barron's on deck. Go ahead, Marley. Hey, Coach, we spoke to Owen Carney a couple weeks ago, and he said that after he left the transfer portal, he had phone conversations with you and Corey Patterson for an hour each day. I'm wondering what those conversations were like and if that's the standard that you kind of have for recruiting and, and relationship building going forward in your program. Marley, I would say this. So like, like I didn't know Owen Carney before I came here. I'd actually seen his name on a list, you know, as a, in, uh, in the NFL, you, you, you begin to do advanced work on possible scouts or, or drafts. Um, but I knew obviously early on, he's a good football player that, you know, has made a decision to enter the transfer portal. We talked a little bit. Um, and then I just kept building a relationship with, with him and, and, and I watched his film and realized that he could, you know, get a lot better. And that's what I really told him. I said, Hey, if you want to be good and let me help you, if you want to be an NFL D lineman, I was just, a, you know what? I coached the NFL. We want to, you know, I've been pretty good. Um, but really for him, I think at some point, then it flipped to now, what can I do for you? All right. To get you where you want to be. And, you know, there was a point one night in the phone call, he said, he coached, I want this, 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 and this. So it was four things, four goals that he had said that he wanted. And I basically said, is that it? Like, is that, is that all you want? And he's like, like, I think I kind of threw him for a loop. He's like, yeah. And it was kind of one of those, it's a good phone call, but it's kind of a combative phone call. Cause like, I get a little, a little, a little hot too. Like, you know, you start telling me something that I know ain't true. Like I'll start getting a little bit feisty as well. So 
his uncle actually told me the next day, you better be a little more good cop than bad cop today. All right. So like I was, I was kind of stressing to him, like, if you start worrying about things you can't control, you're never going to get what you want. If you can just be the best Owen Carney that's ever walked the earth, if you can be the best Owen Carney this spring and spring practice, if you can be the best Owen Carney next fall game two, then you're going to be able to check the box in a lot of areas you've never checked before. And that's what I try to stress to all these guys. If you start worrying about things that, you know, you want to be this fast or that fast, or you want to be this level, you want to be all big 10. Well, why don't you just be the best player you can ever be? And you will check the box along the way. And, and that's kind of where we came to. And then um, really just got to a point where I, I think he knew where, where I was coming from. Um, and, you know, these guys were, when I made transition on staff, these guys liked their coaches. You know what I mean? Like, I know Lovey's a good man. He had an effect on a lot of these guys' hearts. So I was very, I was always trying to be respectful of, I, I know he's a good man. I know he's taught you a lot of good things. Um, but with this transition, I hope to take you to a higher level, you know, and that's just being real with him. Um, so I think some of these guys had to go through the, the pain of hey, it hasn't been very fun here in the last couple of years. And I just lost coaches that I love and how can I help you through it? So I think that was part of the process as well. Thank you. Thank you. Brett Barron, you're up. Jim Cotter on deck or uh, go ahead, Brett. And then we'll go uh, Anthony. Go ahead. Brett, have you completed all of your player evals from the team that was here last year? Uh, Brett, you know, it's a good, I've probably watched everybody on film at some point, but I'm not filling out a, an actual, I just watch them. I try to get familiar with them. And then you're like TA, Tony Adams, you know, he was thinking about making some transition as well. So watched a lot of film with him about him, you know, so I could talk to him about what we could do better uh, to make him a better player. And then really I, I didn't want to get one of the things that you guys, you know, I, I don't like, I want to get to know you and how you perform your job. Right. Like, I don't guess just because you're a reporter, I'm not going to like you. Like, there's a chance I might like you, like, but I got to know who you want. Same thing with our players. I don't want to, you know, just because somebody else told me, oh, he wasn't coachable or he wouldn't do this. I want to see it with my eyes. Like I watched a young man yesterday work out. We had a, a, a freshman um, uh, come in a, 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 a mid-year transfer and he was really struggling with his drill. And one of our, our uh, upperclassmen safeties popped to the front of the line and showed him how to do the drill. Like no coach jumped in there. All right. No, he know and he just did it. And like, to me, like that, that was probably the best part of my day because I knew that someone a cared and recognizes guys struggling and he knew how to do the drill better. And he, he took the initiative to do that. Like it, it, it tells me we got a team that has a lot of players that think right, act right and do right. And we just all get to get on the same page. To follow up with that, do you feel good about the, the roster you have now? And what was your takeaways from what you've seen on tape and, and the group that you're inheriting? Yeah, you know, um, I would say because we've been able to retain some of those seniors, those bonus seniors, um, because some guys that possibly could have left decided to stay. Um, you know, I don't know where my roster at. I just know that, you know, we're, we're getting tight on scholarships here towards the end, you know, about the, the way that these are going to play out because we have initials and we have, you know, some guys that we could sign forward. Um, I'm trying to get the best players so that we can have the best team we possibly can this year. I'm not going to skip a step to get to where we want to be, I'm, but I'm trying to be good now. Like, I don't want to wait three years from now. And I think because of the way the rules are right now, you can kind of try to do that. Um, but I also know that we've got a lot of work to do. They've never done one practice where I've been at the helm, you know, deciding how practices run. You know, we're going to do things a little bit different. You know, the physicality that we'll practice with, the uh, detail that we'll practice with will probably be, something they haven't seen before. Um, but I don't know that uh, because I didn't look at any practice film from last year. I just can kind of see the way they're reacting to what we're doing, that these are things they've never been pushed or put in this position to do. And so there'll be a transitional phase here that we got to work through. Thanks. Yep. We have time for just another question or two, Anthony Pascal, and then uh, maybe John, we'll go ahead, Anthony. Hey, Coach, uh, sorry if you've been asked this already. I came straight from class, but was there any common denominator for you during this coaching search or maybe any box that each candidate crossed? Um, any common denominator? I, I, Anthony, I appreciate the question. I'll just answer it this way. I think this is where you're going with it. Like um, the, one, the one thing I think you can do in this world is be consistent, right? So like um, when I'm hiring my assistant coaches, I take the same approach when I'm trying to select a player to come in and be a part of it. Uh, or if I'm hiring a video guy or if I'm hiring a, a recruiting personnel guy or a, 
uh, uh, an on-campus recruiter. I want consistency in what we're doing, right? So I look for people that are good people, that appreciate family, that love to win, right? And if you can have those characteristics, um, you got a chance to be successful. One of our players, uh, uh, you know, brought this up, and there's there's just three things I talk about all the time in life, right? If you you if you can wake up every day and do what's right, be respectful for others, and and be the best you. If you do those three things every day, you can have a lot of success. And I I stress that for, that was the first thing I told all of our coaches. It's the first thing I told over 95 players. Like if you can just wake up every day and be you know do what's right, be respectful of others, and and be the best you every day, you got a chance. And and that's a simplistic way to look at it, maybe, but I think it's working. Uh, it, it works, and it, and it puts you in a position to have success. Thanks, Coach. Yep. Okay, this will Glad be you went to class, man. <laughs> this will be final question. John Sapini, go ahead, John. Hey, Coach, can you just d describe um, the challenges of this new Zoom recruiting, trying to get your 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 message across to each to a player or a coach or whatever you're recruiting, and your personality, I guess, at the same time through a screen. John, great question. Obviously, we're doing it right now, right? I mean, you can get a little bit of, of who I am, um, you know, but I would say that obviously there's a little bit lost in, in the Zoom fact there. But the thing that people don't realize, and I'm, like, I'm not trying to, you know, tip off our opponents at all, but like the great thing right now is, you know, you might have a kid, maybe he's from a two parent home, right? And they're not in the same home, but you can have a kid that's at home doing remote learning, a mom that, Maybe she's at work or, or in an environment she's not in the house and a dad that lives in another city and an uncle that lives in another state and a, and a, uncle, a cousin or that, that's playing football in another, another part of the country or a brother that he loves and respects that's playing at a, a, a school that's a thousand miles away. All of a sudden, all of us can be on that Zoom call. There's no limits to Zoom, right? I mean, like you can have as many people on there as you want. And now we just walk through and talk through. And then we'll start on the front end with a, with with people that introduce, right? We'll get Tank, he'll go in the weight room. He'll, you know, be showing his body composition and his uh, uh, testing that he put those guys through. And then we'll walk into the training room and Jeremy will show him that that training room that's second to none. We'll walk through the lobby and see him a lobby that'll make him wow. And then uh, a couple of my young bucks might take him on a, on a player tour through the locker room um, and, and get to see a, a bowling alley, a, a pool table, a shuffleboard table, and, uh, you know, a, a bunch of really cool stuff that they're going to walk through on a daily basis. And you, you can just see the way people react. Um, it has an effect, you know, so maybe it's not ideal, but kind of to the point of earlier, we're just going to, we don't make the rules. We just, we just follow them. And, and that's the rule world we're living in right now. And until that world comes that we can go start seeing them or they can come start seeing us. It's the best option we got. Thanks coach. Thank you. All right, coach. Thank you. Uh, we'll do this again sometime uh, in the next several weeks and, and uh, catch up again. So appreciate your time today. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Brad.